Good morning. Our message today is a question. Will there be a resurrection? And we're going to see what Jesus has to say about this in Luke chapter 20. And we'll read verses 27 to 38. Very plain teaching about the resurrection. Also some very puzzling thoughts about marriage and eternity and things like that, which really we aren't even going to touch that because we're just more interested in the resurrection. Will there be a resurrection? Well, let's read what the Bible says here. Then some of the Sadducees who deny that there is a resurrection came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies having a wife, and he dies without children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died without children. And the second took her as wife, and he died childless. Then the third took her, and in like manner the seven also. And they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife does she become? For all seven had her as wife. And Jesus answered and said to them, The sons of this age marriage and are, marry and are given in marriage. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage nor can they die any more, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For he is not the God of the dead, but the living, for all live to him. Will there be a resurrection? There have always been people in the world that think of themselves as free thinkers who attempt to undermine the truth as God has revealed it. These Sadducees were such. They dismissed the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead and the thought of eternal life. Just dismissed it out of hand. They denied that the body would return to life after it died. They denied that the soul continued to live in an unseen world. In fact, they did not even believe that humans have souls. They did not believe in the spirit world and they did not believe in an eternal condition of reward or punishment for what was done during life. While the Sadducees were an elitist and progressive sect in their time, their spirit is alive and well in our time, and it actually infects most of our population. For example, the false theory of evolution defines humans as mere animals that are of a higher development than the rest of the animal life. Even though mankind has evolved into a sentient, rational state, he has no spirit, and he can exist only as long as the body lives. When the body dies, the human ceases to exist, and nothing remains. There is no spirit that lives on. There is no afterlife. And, they believe, there is no God to judge a person's life. And there is no heaven or hell. Evolution is the religion of modern-day Sadducees. In our lesson today, we find the Sadducees arguing with Jesus over the resurrection. They bring up an argument they are convinced will be impossible for Jesus to answer. 
And in their thinking, Jesus having no answer would prove their belief to be true. Well, this is a common ploy among modern Sadducees. You see, they think Christians are stupid and they believe their theories destroy everything Christians believe. And it is a sad thing, though, that too many Christians are not firmly grounded in the faith or they are afraid to engage the Sadducees around them. But we do thank God that there have been and are such men as C.S. Lewis, Francis Schaeffer, Josh McDowell, and Lee Strobel, among others, that have taken on these Sadducees and beat them at their own game. Now, on the day the Sadducees argued with Jesus, they came up with a scenario they knew Jesus could not answer and that would defeat the whole idea of a resurrection. In fact, their argument was based on the Bible. In fact, it was based on Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. This article of the Law of Moses requires, did you hear that? Requires that if a man, a married man died without having his son, a son, his own brother was to marry his widow and have a son who would receive the dead man's inheritance. Technically, because the widow produced the son while married to her first husband's brother, she was considered to be the wife of the dead man, the first husband. Why? Because her son was the legal inheritance of that man's estate, the first husband. The Sadducees came up with a ridiculous but plausible argument they thought contradicted the very possibility of a resurrection. And their story, which we read, said that there were seven brothers. The first brother married but died before he could have a son. Fact one. The next brother marries the woman according to the law, but he dies before he can have a son. And because there was not a son born that would inherit the first brother's estate, the woman was not considered to be the wife of that dead first brother. Okay? And so it happened that all seven of the brothers married this one woman and did not produce a son. Because there was no son under the law of inheritance, she was not considered to be the wife of any one of them under that law of inheritance. But the fact remained, she was actually married to all seven of the brothers, a fact of reality and not just a legal position under the law of Moses. So with such a contradiction between the reality and the law, a resurrection presents a conundrum. And if you don't know what a conundrum is, it's a puzzling question that seems to have no possible answer. Whose wife will she be because all seven brothers were legally married to her, but there was no son born to her that would tie her to only one of the brothers as a wife. Hmm. Makes you scratch your head. Did you understand what I just described? And people kind of looking blank. Not really. Well, Jesus answered them saying that they really didn't understand marriage, let alone the resurrection. He says in verse 34, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. In other words, marriage exists for this present world to replace the population as Genesis generations pass away. Friends, this is what marriage is about. Not just some legal ordinance of the Mosaic law. He then reminds them in verses 37 to 38 
that the very Moses who wrote the law was told by God that the dead do live after physical death. He quotes, But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The rationale for that, for he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For all live to him. That very last statement, for all live to him, is a fact that is either a blessing or a curse. And for the Sadducees, it was a curse. The contemporary English version translates the phrase, for all live to him, as this means that everyone is alive as far as God is concerned. I really like that rendering. Everyone. Hey, if you go out to the cemeteries around this town, everyone is alive as far as God is concerned. You will eventually face God whether or not you believe in a resurrection. Paul stated this fact from the Christian perspective in Romans chapter 14, verses 8 and 9. He wrote, For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. All live as far as God is concerned. And those people that we think of being dead, their bodies are buried in the grave. Uh, we think of them as dead. But as far as God's concerned, they are still very much alive. Why do people not believe in a resurrection? First, let me say that people really are spirit and body, not just body, as the evolutionists would believe. And because of this, all people have some sense that they are everlasting beings, whether or not they will admit it. That's just something about human beings. Even if they don't want to believe in it, there's just something about them that feels like they will continue to go on and on and on even after death. Also, people are moral beings that have a sense of right and wrong. And they have a conscience that puts guilt on them when they do what they know is wrong or they do not do what they know is right. And because of these things, there is an innate sense of eternal reward or punishment after this life. And this is seen not just in Christianity, it is also seen in obscure, primitive, pagan religions. Somehow, mankind, even not exposed to the Bible, has a sense that he's going to live after he dies and he's going to face some kind of consequence or reward for how he lived in life. Well, in spite of this innate sense, unregenerate mankind believes he makes the rules for his own life. And that is a gift from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. If a man can dismiss God from his life, he feels he has no one to account for any of his actions. If a man dismisses the fact of a resurrection, he honestly believes there is no consequence for his wrongdoing and his rejecting God. You see, dismissing the resurrection is a convenience of the conscience. Dismissing the resurrection is a convenience of the conscience. 
But what does Jesus say about the resurrection? I'm interested in what he has to say because, hey, he has experienced the resurrection. Jesus affirms the fact of the resurrection in his conversation with the Sadducees. He says in verse 36, being sons of the resurrection, he uses that expression. And then in verse 38, he says, for he's not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. So right in that very conversation with those unbelievers, two times Jesus affirms the fact of the resurrection. But listen, the most direct teaching of Jesus on the resurrection is found in John chapter 5, verses 24 through 29. I want to read those verses. You might want to mark those verses in your Bible. They are very, very, very important. What did Jesus teach? Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word, this is Jesus talking, and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. Okay, everlasting life. What is everlasting life? Life that lasts forever. Life that doesn't stop. And he says, if you believe in him, it shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to ex execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Listen, do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which, there's a really big word right there, all, <laughs> only has three letters in it. And two of them are repeated of the same letter. All. How many are all? Anybody? How many are left out? Okay. But which all are we talking about here? Which all who are in the graves? There are a lot of people in graves. Okay. There are a lot, you know, since Adam and Eve came into the world. More people have died and been buried than are living on earth today. You know, there is, what, 7 billion people in the world today? How many people have lived and died since creation? Beyond trillions, zillions. I don't know what the correct number is. All that are in the graves, all those trillions of trillions of people, that have died, those of you that are living and will die, you will hear the voice of the Son of God. All who are in the graves will hear His voice and do what? Come forth. Come forth. They will be resurrected. That is going to be one day, isn't it? Can you imagine? It'd be something for seven billion people in the, alive in the world to be transformed and caught up. But think of all the trillions of people that are going to be loosed from the, de from the grave and resurrected to be caught up before God. It's going to be a big crowd, my friend. A big crowd. But notice what Jesus said about this resurrection. And it should give you pause for thought and a reason for concern. He says, those who've done good to the resurrection of life and those that have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So in this general resurrection, there are two parts that happen simultaneously. They happen at the same time. Jesus teaches both everlasting life 
and judgment. People do continue to live after they lay down their bodies in physical death. And there is a definite time appointed in the near future or the distant future in which Christ will speak from heaven and all who are in the grave will be resurrected. So from what Jesus says, we learn that people in the grave are not actually dead, even though their bodies have ceased to live. How many of us know someone who has died? We all do. But do you realize that person is not really dead? Yes, their body died and was buried in some way. But that person is very much alive right now. And whatever capacities they may have while they are presently in the grave, one thing we know for sure is that when Jesus speaks at the end of time, they will hear him. We call this the general resurrection. But notice Jesus teaches that there are two elements in this general resurrection. The first is the resurrection of life that consists of those that have done good. And the second is the resurrection of condemnation consisting of those that have done evil. Now, stop and think about that for just a moment. Good and evil here do not mean good people and bad people. These words that Jesus used refer to the moral choice God gave mankind in the Garden of Eden with the tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil. Those that have done good are those who accept God's gift of salvation from sin and they have their moral compass redirected to the knowledge of good by the indwelling presence of the Spirit of God. And those that have done evil are those that reject or neglect God's gift of salvation and leave their moral compass directed to the knowledge of evil. All people are accountable to Jesus, including Sadducees, both the ancient ones and the modern ones, because why God the Father has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. The Apostle Paul sums up the significance of the resurrection in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. He wrote, For we must, well, there's that big word again, for we must all appear, where? Before the judgment seat of whom? Of Christ. That each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. First, notice that all must appear. No one is overlooked or left out because all will be resurrected, just as Jesus said. And second, notice that you, sitting here today, you listening to this message, you will appear at the judgment seat of Christ. You see, he is the appropriate judge because he is the one that made possible the forgiveness of your sins. If you have accepted what he did to make your salvation possible, and if you allow him to set the compass of your heart to the good, you have nothing to fear at the judgment. If you've neglected or rejected his offer of salvation and let the compass of your heart stay pointed to the bad, to the knowledge of evil, 
you will have all eternity to regret it. And notice that Paul adds an ominous caveat to what he said. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord. Wow, the terror of the Lord. As much as God so loves the world that he makes salvation from sin possible, in eternity, rejecting his love removes one from even the possibility of any artifact of God's love. That thought might not frighten you right now, but that terror will be an eternal reality if you are not prepared for the resurrection. The resurrection is a coming event. So what do you need to do to be ready for it? Well, Paul answers that question in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. He said, Behold, now. Another three-letter word. Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Yes, there will be a resurrection. Are you ready? Amen.